One of the hardest parts of having to respond to Graham Linehan is the fact that inevitably, we have to listen to him. His smug, condescending voice asserting that he knows what's best for women, all whilst harming vast numbers of them in ignoring all ethics and science on the matters he forces himself onto. Did you know that in 2019, the US Navy started using recordings of Linhan's interviews to repel sperm whales that swam too close to naval shipyards during mating seasons? The US Navy would amplify his voice on massive underwater speakers. The animals would be so repulsed by what they heard that they'd fail to get their freak on. That's right, whales sing trans rights. That and... Shut the fuck up, Graham. Now of course all this is bullshit, but in Graham Linehan's topsy-turfy world, a world where opinion is elevated to the level of scientific fact, where ethical medical practice is equated to eugenics, it very well could be true. Now I'm sure many of you are aware by now of my ongoing feud with Mr. Linehan who attempted to help an associate of his compile a list of therapists willing to partake in gender identity conversion efforts, rebranded as the gender critical approach. I'm also sure many of you are aware of the facts that Mr. Linehan has threatened to sue me for reporting on the matter, as well as the facts that I'm now fundraising in case this goes to court. However, whilst all this was going on, Graham Linehan was invited onto the BBC to share his views on the fact that his actions have consequences. That, as his obsessive transphobic and misogynistic nature has bloomed, companies and other creators have tossed him as far away from them as possible like a lit piece of dynamite. Of course, all the self-pity was thrown out there with lies about trans people and the medical science. So, there's no putting it off really. It's a 7 minute interview, so let's see what he had to say and just get this over with. Well, Graham Lanahan is with me now. Um, you wrote a piece in the papers at the weekend. You say you've been vilified mm -hmm. on social media and that you've even lost work as a result of speaking out in this trans debate. Why have you got yourself mired in this? You're not a trans person, you're not a woman. Why have you made this your issue? Uh, well, the main reason is that women can't speak about this. Um, uh, uh, women like... I, I, I'll admit, I'm not a great person to be in this conversation. I'm a comedy writer, and I am very blunt. But the thing is, there's a lot of women, um, like Kathleen Stock, Jane Claire Jones, uh, academics, who, who are very compassionate, um, but they protect their boundaries and the boundaries of, of, of young lesbians and, and, um, uh, and women in general. And they do so in a very respectful, quiet way. But whenever they're asked to speak, uh, there's protests, they get shut down. Um, uh, Kathleen Stock had a freedom of information request about her emails. You know, it, it's insane the abuse and harassment they face. So I thought I'd step in and, you know, I don't have, I don't have a boss as such. Yeah, but, but has, has stepping in made the debate any better? What really amazes me is just how unaware Graham is here. Graham has spent the last couple of years constantly abusing women, both cis and trans, trying to force them to shut up because they had the mere audacity to have an opinion on a matter that affects them and not him. An opinion that doesn't align with his. Most notably, perhaps, is the case of Linda Riley, an internationally renowned lesbian who is the publisher for Diva magazine. Europe's leading magazine for lesbians and bisexual women. And because Linda is accepting of her trans sisters, Graham went out of his way to attempt to undermine her credibility as a lesbian and erase the sexuality of her readership. A massively homophobic, biphobic and misogynistic act on his part, done with the sole intent of discrediting lesbian voices. The very same voices Graham sits there claiming are being silenced by trans people. But it doesn't just end there. Following Graham Linehan's call for people to help him in his goal of torturing trans children into being cisgender, Pink News reported on the incident. They were then threatened by lawsuit and, for whatever reason, decided to take down their article. We're still unsure as to whether or not they received legal notice or just preemptively removed it. However, someone else reached out to outspoken international feminist Mona Eltoui on the matter. A woman who has literally put her body on the line to fight for justice in places such as Egypt, where she had both of her arms broken 
and was sexually assaulted by riot police in 2011. Then in 2018, she practically led the Mosque Me Too movement. Well, after she labelled Graham's actions as, quote, dangerous, hateful, vicious, end quote, in her professional opinion, the gremlin of a man popped up to threaten her with lawsuit as well. Reminder, this is a man who went on national television to claim that his abuse of trans people is fine because he's trying to help women speak. Uh, have you maybe tried not threatening to sue them, Graham? Hell, even in my case, much the same is happening. Yes, I'm the presenter for Essence of Thought, but Adita is both my editor and legal advisor. She is the other half of the channel, and she signed off on my video as a cis woman slash human rights lawyer. So when Graham threatens to sue the channel over the video, it's not just me he's threatening, but Adita. And she might have to leave her job at the current human rights organization she works at to fight this if it actually goes to court. An organization that tackles sexual harassment, child marriage, and Indian witch burnings. All whilst Graham puts out the pretense of helping women speak. On top of this, a recent hangout by both Christy Winters and Kevin Logan, which covered Linhun, was flagged down. Both Christy and Kevin, by the way, played a large part in sticking up to Gamergate. Christy Winters in particular, becoming target for many of the large bigots, such as Carla Swindon, also known as Sargon of Akkad. And just like the fans of a man who makes rape threats towards female MPs, Graham's fans flag said video for daring to criticize him. Now, did Graham come out and apologize? Did he tell his fans that stifling the free speech of women, specifically feminist academics, wasn't cool? Of course he didn't. Graham's actions seem to tell us rather strongly that he doesn't actually care about cis women regardless of past actions, that they're really just a resource for him to exploit, as is the way of patriarchy. He only accepts women speaking out if those women lockstep with what he says. Otherwise, he'll go so far as threatening them with lawsuit. However, his lies go beyond that in the way that he presents the few transphobic voices out there as being respectable. Well, for a start, that is impossible by definition. You cannot respect someone whilst simultaneously erasing their existence, which is what both they and he do on a regular basis. But even ignoring that, it's just flat out false. For example, Venice Allen, or as she refers to herself online, Dr. Radfem, no actual degree, stalked and harassed an elected member of the Labour Party, Lily Madigan, a 17-year-old girl. Alan was in her mid-30s at the time. Alan would take photographs of Lily from across the room and then post them to social media where the abuse and threats would build until Lily was eventually sent the post and saw the abuse herself. Venice Allen was expelled from the Labour Party for her stalking in 2017. Then we have Linda Bellos, a public speaker for these groups who openly advocate for physical violence against trans people. Not in self-defense, not in the moment, but they explicitly on the grounds of what they were doing on a political level, i.e. securing their civil and human rights, something that also happened in 2017. And of course, there was the very thing that set this all off. The person Graham Linehan was seeking to help compile a list of therapists willing to partake in gender identity conversion efforts, was Stella O'Malley, a cis woman and full-time quack who seeks to torture trans children into denying their gender, something which is illegal in the UK, but sadly not in Ireland. That is not respectable. That is vile to the highest degree. But as noted at the start, Linehan doesn't care for reality. He doesn't care for the demonstrable truth. Whilst a few women that support him harass and stalk trans people, openly call for violence against us, or even seek to torture trans children, Graham turns to the people protesting these acts and claims that said protest stifle freedom of speech. When no, those protests are freedom of speech and political action. But Graham can't deal with that, so he takes a page from the fascist playbook and 
makes the same tired argument about how bigots have to not only be platformed, but any challenge to what they say is totalitarianship, ignoring the glaring hypocrisy. Then again, I guess that position is mandatory if you want to rightfully daily fail, what can be best described as a fascist rag. As for Kathleen Stock and the Freedom of Information request, welcome to university. Staff are told very clearly that they are subject to such requests and therefore they should be careful of what they say. The emails they send via the institutional email are not private but public information and are therefore subject to the same freedom of information laws. Laws, Kathleen Stock is also more than happy to publicly support if she feels like it's beneficial to her. Now, to be fair, the second one of these tweets was put out on February the 12th, a couple of days after Graham's interview. But the other one is from 2018. If said requests are an act of silencing, then Caitlin Stock is equally guilty of supporting such efforts, something Graham has failed to acknowledge, just as with every other inconvenient fact displayed so far. And all this dishonesty has taken place in the first minute of a seven minute interview, none of which is actually challenged or corrected. Though to Sarah Smith's credit, she did raise an important question. But has, has stepping in made the debate any better? I mean, a lot of people say that the language you've used, some of the dismissive terms that you've bandied about have actually increased the toxicity of this C can debate. Can you give me an example? Yes, you can. You, yeah, I'll, I'll give you several if you want. <laughs> so um, what about comparing people in the trans debate to speaking out against Nazis? I mean, that's pretty extreme. Well, there's a couple of parallels. One is that at the moment, um, children are... Uh, basically being experimented on with uh, uh, puberty blockers. Uh, for instance... Oh, come on, you're not seriously trying to say that children going to the doctor and saying that they're worried about their gender is akin to children being experimented on in Nazi I'm concentration afraid, camps? I'm, I'm afraid I am, because Lupron, which is, which is um, a drug that's supposed to be meant for end-stage cancer treatment, uh, prostate cancer treatment, is being given to okay, young girls. These... It has never been tested on girls. It has never been tested on women. No, that's happening no, to no, young well, women look, at the look, moment. Lupron is just a generic hormone blocker used in a wide range of medical treatments. Yes, the treatment of hormone-sensitive cancers is among them, but so are things such as precocious puberty, also known as early-onset puberty. Lupron and various other puberty-blocking medications have been used for the past three decades to store puberty in both boys and girls with no significant drawback observed. So to claim that they're untested and that children are being experimented on amounts to little more than a disgraceful lie that stands in stark opposition to the medical reality. Now, of course, there can be complications. Not simply because they're medications, but because when the hormonal balance of the body shifts, there's always the potential for complications. That's whether said changes are natural or artificial. The ethical question is, do the benefits of the medical treatment outweigh any potential risks? Now, at what age are these medications used? Well, the cutoff point for precocious puberty in assigned girls is 8 years, and for assigned boys, 9 years. So it's given to them in the years before those cutoff points, sometimes as early as 1 year of age, though those cases are extraordinarily rare. Trans teens, meanwhile, might receive puberty blockers after seeing a trained therapist as they enter Tanner stages 2 to 3, so from 9 to 12 years of age when they start the medication. They'll then stay on puberty blockers for two to four years as they go through a series of medical checks and examinations before they're ever considered for hormone replacement therapy, averaging at around 16 years of age. Which, by the way, is the age of full medical consent in the Republic of Ireland under the Non-Fatal Offences Against the Person Act of 1997. That is, they can give full medical consent with zero parental input. But I don't hear Graham taking issue with that. It should also be noted that puberty blockers have been tested and tested on children for decades at that and have never been found to result in extreme complications. If removed after administration, the body will resume puberty whether it utilizes the body's own hormones or once the teenager has been given. All it does is delay puberty long enough for a teenager to mature and make an informed medical decision with professional support. 
sparing them the pain of going through an unnecessary puberty. Now yes, these medications are also used in the treatment of cancer. Why? While well, certain cancers respond particularly aggressively to the body's own hormones, so by blocking said hormones using medications, you can reduce the cancer's impact on the patient. So why is Graham throwing this out there? Well, what do you think of when you hear the phrase cancer treatment? You think of chemotherapy, a particularly brutal form of medication that amounts to poisoning the body in hopes that the cancer dies before the patient. Many of us know the long list of side effects that come with their treatment, and Graham is trying to place Lupron in the same category. The truth is, chemotherapy is used in conjunction with other therapies when other less aggressive methods, such as hormone therapy including the aforementioned Lupron, have failed to work on their own. But as Sarah's about to go on to note, Graham's not a doctor and neither are most people watching. They hear cancer treatment, they hear untested, they hear experimented on, followed by no pushback on those specific claims from Sarah. So regardless of how badly Graham does for the rest of the interview, those specific claims go unchallenged in the minds of most people listening, which, in their eyes, vindicates it as truth, when it's not. As for the Nazi comment, I'll come back to this later since it continues to be raised throughout the interview, and I'd rather wait to deal with it in the full context of everything Graham says on the matter. Look, there's a, there's a couple of issues here. One of, one of them is that these are doctors who are doing this and you don't have any medical training to know about this, but the other is that they are doing it by choice. It is deeply offensive mm. to compare this to Nazi concentration camps. Oh, no, no, were... don't get me wrong. I'm not comparing it to Nazi concentration camps. That's... that's, that's and also... Well, that's, that's, no, that's no, basically what you said, was no, no, that no. experimenting on children mm, is what the Nazis you, did and what doctors are doing today. You, well, um, essentially, if you look at the Tavistock, 35 psychologists have quit the Tavistock in three years. Does that sound... That's one of, one of the centres uh, which deals specifically with um, people yes. who think that they want to uh, change their gender. Yes, that's 35 over three years. Do you think that sounds like a healthy environment for children? I've no idea what the reason why people might be leaving are, but 35 I know that it's, children I've spoken being to able other, to come I've, forward I've spoken and to talk other psych- about issues that they feel, uh, it's entirely up to them whether or not they want to do that. Nobody's forcing anybody into No, no, I'm sorry. Here. You don't tell children that they were born in the wrong body because they're children and they will believe you. That's the important... These are... I've seen kids... Uh, there are reports from the Tavistock that children as young as four were brought in. These are children... You know, children as, as are still believing in Santa when they're ten. You know, it's ridiculous, it's absurd, and it's... Here's another one of those times where Sarah failed to correct Graham, this time on some basic information, namely the facts that the Tavistock and Portman NHS Foundation Trust being discussed, employs over 500 people and trains 2,000 students a year. So 35 isn't even a tenth of its total employees, and reminder, these people left over a three-year period for a variety of reasons. Now it's true, a couple of them resigned because they rejected the scientific consensus on trans people, most notably Marcus Evans, one of the former governors. But to take that and assert rather plainly, as Graham is doing, that the other 34 people who resigned for various reasons such as retirement, other job offers or hell, being constantly attacked in the media by medically illiterate transphobes, such as Graham, all resigned in protest, is entirely baseless. The NHS, as with any practice, has employee turnover. People leave, people retire. It's not a case that they all walked out together in protest of how Tavistock was run. Tavistock just happened to have an average annual turnover of 3% for this three-year period. So what? The NHS as an institution has an average annual turnover of 11.9% for nurses, three times higher than Tavistock. But does Graham start running around fabricating conspiracy theories about the NHS in general? No. Fact is, I've seen what Graham is doing here before, most notably when people attempt to argue against same-gender marriage and adoption. You see, When the medical establishment began to review their assumptions about same-gender attraction and realised that they had no basis to treat it like a disease, they were left with a choice. Either update their policy or ignore the science and violate medical ethics. 
and largely the major establishments decided to go with the evidence. However, not everyone was on board and a large number of people left said organizations and even created some of their own. Organizations such as the American College of Pediatricians, which was created to sound like the legitimate American Academy of Pediatrics. And people have used the same argument Graham is using here to argue against the legalization of same-gender marriage and adoption. And just like then, it is equally as baseless. Even if the entire Tavistock team had resigned, that would not mean a thing. Science and medical ethics is not a popularity contest. Scientists have biases. Doctors have prejudices. What matters is a science which, at the moment, is entirely one-sided. Now Sarah goes on to question Graham's assertions that children are being taught they're the opposite gender, demanding evidence behind said claims. And watch how Graham responds the moment he is asked to provide substance to back up what he says. And what surprises well, first, me... Why do you think... You know, I mean, what evidence do you have that young children are being told they are born into the wrong body? Just because we're having a debate about self-identification doesn't mean that young children who still believe in Santa are being told that they have to change their gender. That's ridiculous exaggeration. No, 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 that's not... Well, well one of the other things that Tavistock whistleblowers reported... The moment Graham's expected to defend his assertion, he completely changes the topic. Why? Well, because not only does he lack any evidence to support his tinfoil conspiracy, but the evidence we do have completely eviscerates his lies. I am, of course, referring to the desistance rates of children referred to gender identity clinics. Namely, how as many as 84.2% of children and young teens refer to gender identity clinics, clinics which take the gender affirmative approach, seek no further support from said clinics. Now, people like Graham know about this since they like to assert that the 84.2% of cases consists of parents doing nothing that a child with gender dysphoria will settle. However, this is a misrepresentation of the actual study, namely the way it qualifies gender dysphoria. It doesn't do so on grounds of a clinical diagnosis of the condition, but simply the act of being referred to such a clinic by an untrained adult such as a parent or a school counsellor, someone who does not understand the difference between gender expression and gender identity. Because the DSM and all surrounding literature on the matter is very clear. A child simply not adhering to gendered roles such as a girl being a tomboy does not make them trans. So these clinics work along with children to explore who they are in an entirely child-led therapy to see whether they're just gender non-conforming or whether they are indeed transgender. The follow-up study to the one that gave us the 84.2% stat found clear differences between those who persisted and those who desisted after receiving support at the gender identity clinics. But the fact is, contrary to what Graham asserts, the vast majority of children referred to clinics like Tavistock receive no further support because they're not transgender. The lie that doctors are out there telling young children that they are is no different than, say, the lie that same gender inclusive sex and relationship education is showing young children hardcore gay pornography. It's entirely baseless, yet is thrown out there to try and induce a moral panic, something that's incredibly easy due to the ages involved. Fact is, children, both cis and trans, start to develop an understanding of who they are, including both their gender and sexuality at a very young age. Now, it may take some longer to discover the full nature of their existence, especially in a world where LGBT plus terminology is seen as inappropriate for small children in a cis-normative and heteronormative world. Cisgender people get gender, transgender people get gender identity, straight people get love, gay and bisexual people get sexuality. The truth is, these things are age appropriate and children should be given both the resources and the environment to fully explore who they are in confidence and safety. As for why Graham is attempting to change the topic, this is a gish gallop, a debate strategy in which you throw out as many assertions as possible in a short period of time, giving no care to the accuracy or strength of said arguments in hopes to overwhelm the opposition by sheer volume. Because whatever is responded to, there will always be something that was missed, giving the missed items a pass. 
the other things that Tavistock whistleblowers reported was that homophobic parents were bringing in their gender non-conforming kids and telling them to fix them. You know, there was a dark joke that went around the Tavistock where they said that in, in a couple of years there'll be no gay people left. You know, now that's why I compare it to eugenics programs and things like that. It, it, it is extremely serious. It's ex No, it's a fucking lie. That did not happen. That does not happen. What does happen in a society where gay people are far more accepted than trans people is trans people are very often told, well, can't you just be gay? Why? Well, because shits like Graham equate sexuality with gender, when they're not dependent on one another. Gay trans people exist. People who, if they kept their gender hidden, would appear to be outwardly cisgender and heterosexual. But they can't live that lie, so they come out as trans, which, regardless of the erasure Graham likes to take part in, changes the perception of their relationship to a same-gender one. Now what do I mean by erasure? Well, it goes back to Linda Riley and the Diva magazine readership, namely how many lesbians accept trans women as women and are therefore perfectly happy to date them. On top of this, many trans women are also lesbians. Now Graham comes along and asserts that the existence of such lesbians, both cis and transgender, erases lesbianship, somehow, declaring that trans women are actually men and cannot be lesbians, and that every lesbian open to dating trans women is also a fake lesbian. So who is actually trying to erase LGB people? Because it's not the trans community and their supporters. I'm a bisexual trans person. I've been sexually active with both men and women. Being trans didn't stop that. So Graham, this cisgender heterosexual man, is talking complete and total bollocks. And all I'm asking for, all I'm asking for is that people like me and the women that I support are not attacked, their meetings aren't protested, they aren't abused on Twitter. I've been sued, yeah, okay. I've, been, I've been reported to the police. I know, yeah. My, you, wife, you, you, my wife's address has been published online. All these you, things have happened because I'm trying to make and comparing conversation the trans debate less toxic. To... Hold on a second. What was that he listed there in the middle? All I'm asking for is that people like me and the women that I support are not attacked, their meetings aren't protested, their meetings aren't protested, their meetings aren't protested. That's where the mask slips. Graham Linehan's idea of toxicity includes trans people protesting attempts to strip them of their human and civil rights. So to be rid of that toxicity, trans people have to be willing to allow transphobic rhetoric to roll out unopposed. That cisgender people like Graham can say whatever they like and transgender people are silenced. Some might say that I was extreme in calling out his earlier actions as stealing from the fascist playbook, but this right here just proves that statement with absolute certainty. Free speech in Graham's mind is the right to say bigoted things without any pushback. This isn't about toxicity. This is about silencing a vulnerable, marginalised group so the steps for their eradication can be rolled out rather easily. As for everything else, don't try to excuse violence acted on in self-defence to the initial violence carried out by people such as Graham. Trans people exist and that existence carries with it various human and civil rights. Graham and others came in and set about denying us those rights or even rolling them back. That is political violence. Anything we do following that is self-defense in the exact same vein as every other civil and human rights movement throughout history. It is a continuation of the trans riots at Compton Cafeteria and Stonewall. Graham can walk away from being a transphobic bigot, at least publicly. We can't walk away from being trans. It is do or die for us. Right, talking about eugenics and comparing trans activists to Nazis is yes. not going to make this debate less toxic. What you're doing is fanning the flames. You're throwing trans fuel on this. Trans activists threaten the feminists I support with rape and death threats, OK? So, so the idea that there's an equivalence between these two, I am absolutely happy to step out of this conversation completely once women like D uh, Kathleen Stock and Jane Claire Jones are allowed to speak. quite a lot of women think that they can speak for themselves, thank you, and they don't necessarily need Graham well, Lennon to come in and talk for us. Well, the women I support uh, are, value my support and are glad that I'm amplifying their voices. 
and amplifying the toxicity of a debate no, when you come no, in no, here no. and use these this kind of inflammatory toxic. language. These women are not toxic. These women are I'm not saying are they measured. are. I'm saying it's your comparisons tonight that are pretty toxic, coming in here and talking about Nazis. If you want to have a reasonable debate about what's going on with gender identity in this country, we can't talk about Nazis the in thing, the same the breath. Thing, the thing about the Nazi comment was, was what I was trying to get across was that this is a hinge moment in history, just like, just like during the Nazis. And we always ask ourselves the same questions. We we ask ourselves, what would I have done? Would I have bowed down? Would, have, would I have done, done everything I was told to do? Or would, have I, would I have resisted? Would I have stood up and would I have stood up alongside people who were trying to do the right thing? That's what I'm trying to do at the moment. And it's being made very, very difficult. The only thing making this difficult is the fact that you refuse to actually do the ethical thing and support gender affirmative care. Instead, setting out to enable the torture of trans and gender non-conforming children through gender identity conversion efforts, which have been dishonestly rebranded as the gender critical approach. You are not on the right side of history. You are fighting to deny children necessary social and medical support, something that can be demonstrated to harm their quality of life to such a degree that it increases attempted suicide rates from a baseline of 8% to as high as 57%. That is what you are fighting for, no matter how much you wish to deny reality. You are actively lying about the medications, even though you've had this explained to you repeatedly, because you do not care. All you want to do is continue to propagate the lie that children are being experimented on, when really, you just want to torture them. And unlike you, I can and have shown evidence of that medical fact. Now, some people, such as each other founder, Adam Wagner, were quick to point out the disgusting nature of Graham's comparing of children receiving vital medical care to Nazi experiments. Hell, Lord Eric Pickles, co-chair of the UK Holocaust Memorial Foundation, absolutely roasted Graham for the comparison, stating that his actions trivialised what occurred. And that is true. But it's worse than that. Why? Well, because of one simple fact that all cis writers seem to be leaving out the conversation. And that's the fact that one of the groups the Nazis attempted to exterminate were trans people, transvestites, a term which at the time referred to people whose gender did not match that they were assigned at birth and would seek both hormone replacement and surgery from the Hirschfeld Institute for Sexual Wissenschaft, the Institute of Sex Research. Founded in 1919, the institute was really the first of its kind, helping trans patients undergo gender confirmation and offering comprehensive sex education to both gay and bisexual people. However, when the Nazis rose to power, things changed. On the 6th of May 1933, Nazi youth raided the institute and seized all patient documents and proceeded to destroy over 20,000 books in public book burnings with over 40,000 attendees. This was one of the major book burnings that many of our images of what took place came from. Then following the Night of the Long Knives, it is believed the patient documents were used by the Gestapo and the SS to locate and incarcerate LGT plus folk, placing them in concentration camps wearing the pink triangle. Sadly, the horror didn't end there. Whilst every other targeted demographic was released after the war, the pink triangles were usually sentenced to further imprisonment or other punishments by their reigning governments. So what Graham is doing here isn't simply trivialising the Holocaust, he is in fact continuing the work of Nazis in his public campaigning for the torture of trans children in hopes to turn them cisgender. What he has said throughout this interview is nothing but demonstrable projection. The fact that the medications are tested and safe the fact that it's consensual, the fact that gay and bisexual trans people exist, all of this proves definitively that his narrative about how gay and lesbian children are being experimented on as part of some eugenics project is without merit. The complete opposite to our ability to show his support for the torture and extermination of trans people. And that's all I have to say on that. Look, you know, Two years ago, we wrote to Stonewall, way before I compared trans, trans rights activists to Nazis, and we, said, and we said, could we please bring down the toxicity of this conversation? Could we, could we uh, please just look at some of these issues, some of these 
points where women's rights mm. conflict with trans rights and just talk about it. And within the day, Stonewall said no. They said they, absolutely they, not. So they said to us today, we invited them to come on the programme and instead they gave us a statement saying trans, pe trans people in Britain face huge levels of abuse in all areas of their life. They quote statistics uh, showing that hate crimes against trans people have increased 37% in the last year and say they're proud of their work towards trans equality. Yes, but the reason hate crimes have increased is because everything is now transphobic, including saying statements like men aren't women. These are considered transphobic statements. So, so, so the reason that these hate crime figures are going up is because the bar has been set so low for what is and isn't transphobic. There has to be a conversation about this. It is absolutely crucial. Children... Okay. Well, that, that, that's all the time we have for this conversation tonight. I'm okay. uh, fairly confident it will continue on social media. I'm sure um, it will. Graham Lenehan, thank you. And his evidence of that assertion is... Oh, wait, nothing. In fact, between 2018 and 2019, during the period in which we saw a 37% increase in total anti-trans hate crimes, the portion of said anti-trans crimes that were public order offences actually decreased from 43% down to 39%, whilst other notifiable offences remained the same at 5%. Public order offences typically refers to acts that make others feel afraid, and those along with other notifiable offences are really the only things that could arguably be stretched in the manner Graham is asserting. The other categories, meanwhile, were violence with and without injury, stalking and harassment, criminal damage, and arson. And it's the stalking and harassment that has increased dramatically, yet still not enough to account for the 37% total increase, I must add. Now why is this? Well, because transphobic bigots such as the people Graham Linehan supports routinely partake in such activities, because this has never been about respectable debate. Just look at the examples I discussed earlier. The case of Venice Allen stalking a teenage trans woman and posting photos of her online so that she'd see the abuse. Or of Linda Bellos advocating for violence against trans people, solely for the facts that we seek to secure our civil and human rights. Or hell, Check out this really rough video from the founding meeting of Women's Place UK in which transphoric mouthpiece Julia Long shows images of trans women, dead naming and misgendering them for no reason other than to belittle them. Heavy content warning on that one if you do. Just like the Nazi eugenics thing, his point here is nothing more than projection. And sadly, it's mostly gone unchallenged. Yeah. Sarah asked a few good questions and got a couple of great one-liners in, but the validity of the majority of Graham's claims went untested, mostly because there were so many bold-faced lies. So he still gained from the interview, and all I can do is try to get the truth out on the matters touched upon. Now if you appreciate what myself and Adita do here on the channel in fighting back against said bigotry, do know you can support us via Patreon. Your support gives us the funds to keep going on and keep putting out videos involving this level of research. You can also check out our other videos to see more of what we have to offer. So with that said, we'd just like to thank our Patreon sponsors, giving a special thanks to the following people. Garrett Van Vorst, Hannah Banghart, Matthew Kovac, Soraya and Katie, Mutt Gay, Wellington Marcus, Atlas Five, and Sosh Daniels. And for myself and Adita, take care now.